thank you so much for joining to this service. We've already had a very powerful time of worship, and we're just going to spend some time in the Word. And let me tell you something. I want your faith to be really built up today. Just last week, I got a message of someone that had a stroke, and as they were watching, they were watching on a television station, the man that had a stroke got up and started working. That is powerful. That's a power of our God. We have cases of people that their kids were really sick, that God healed, tumors is appearing, people that God came through in their businesses. I just got a testimony just a just few hours ago, just about the business breakthrough that happened. I'm saying so because I wanted to look at this service with a huge with, a, with expectation in your heart, knowing that God is coming through for you today. Today's our prayer and communion service. I hope you've gotten some bread and some wine before we settle into it. And if today happens to be your first time of connecting to our church, either on social media, on television, or maybe you've been watching for quite a while, but we don't know you, I would personally love to know you. Will you do me just, just a huge favor? Will you send an email or just text that number on the screen and say, I'm new here. One, I will send a gift to you, but not only that, I would get to just be able to pray with you and pray for your family. Hallelujah. At this time, it's, cost, it's customary worship for us. We believe that part of our worship is that we honor the Lord to our giving. I want to sit back and watch this very powerful video and to tell you what your giving is doing and how much in this time of depression we can be a blessing to somebody else. Hello, friends. Investment is what we are all conversant with. That's because a lot of us plan to invest in the money market if we're not doing so already in the stock market or even in real estate or any venture that we deem profitable. But today, I'd like to introduce to you the investment in people. People really matter. And in the season we're living in, not just in our country, but globally, the economic hardships have been brought upon many people in a fashion that is unprecedented because of the global coronavirus pandemic. As a church, we took very decisive steps as early as March to combat this. We provided over 300,000 meals to about 5,000 families. But the lockdown is over, people can move around, but yet when they move around, their businesses are just about to start up. Some cannot, don't even know where to start from. For some people, they have resumed work, but are only earning a fraction of their income. Hence, feeding still becomes a problem. I mean, globally, the World Food Program projects that about 265 million people are likely to go hungry in this season. But as a church, we will not fold our arms and watch because God has placed us here as the light of our world. And that's why I want to invite you to invest with me, invest with us, get your friends, get your families, get your neighbors to invest in other people that are vulnerable at this time. I'm talking about children. I'm talking about single moms. I'm talking about young people that don't know who to turn to. We can be their light and their hope. Details of how you can participate will show on the screen. Once again, thank you for being a part of this. Watching the videos and just seeing the testimonials, the stories, even the ones we cannot show. I'm grateful that we're part of something. I'm grateful that my life and your life and everyone that is given can be used to impact someone else's life. That a child is not going hungry just because you are giving and I'm giving. That families can smile and see God like God sent us an angel. One of the stories I heard was a woman that said when she got the packages during the COVID-19 lockdown, she said, is this a government? He said, it's a church. Tuma said, may God bless these people that I don't know that are blessing us. And I'm saying this to you because as we give today, if you can eat through us three square meals, you should be willing to give to help someone. As we give in our tithes and offerings today, let your faith soar. You know why? Every time you open the door for someone to be helped, God will raise up another person to open up the door for you to be helped. That's what it means when it says, eat that water it shall also be watered. So you're going to have the account details on the screen. If you want to honor the Lord with your tithe, let's know it's your tithe. If it's an offering, if it's, um, if it's an end hunger campaign, let's know. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your word says that the liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered. Today, as your people take up their resources in this very challenging times to water, open the door for them to also be watered. We receive the blessing and the grace of generosity in Jesus' name mighty name. Say after me, say in the name of Jesus Christ, I am blessed to be a blessing. I am the one that lends to nation. Because of me and my resources, other people's life has found meaning. Other people's life have found purpose. Because 
am a great steward of God's resources to people today. And as I give, as I water, I'm also watered by the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So this month, I'm starting a new teaching. And this week, I will be talking about how to unlock hidden potentials. How to unlock hidden potentials. Hidden or inner potentials. Sometimes it's inner, sometimes it's hidden. You know, one of the, one of the things you need to see is that the way God has made everybody, everyone has a potential. You know, sometimes when you walk with people, they'll be like, there's nothing good about me. You know, nobody likes me. I have nothing. And when you talk like that, it's proof that you're listening to the devil. The reason why is that God never made any man as an empty box. Everyone carries potentials from God. What are potentials? Potentials are passive or sleeping abilities. So watch it. These abilities are on the inside of you. These abilities could be singing, could be talking, could be dreaming, could be thinking. It, it's, it's massive. But why are they called potentials? Because they are on the inside of you. These abilities can translate into success in the future. But right now, they are in the sleeping field. And the reason I'm saying so to you is this. Because of so much depression, because of so much scarcity, many of you have settled to even think that there's nothing good about you. You look at your marriage and you don't see potentially your marriage. You look at your man and you don't see potentially your man. You look at your woman and there's no potential in that woman. And you look at your business and there's no potential inside there. But just remember, God does not create empty boxes. He doesn't. As a matter of fact, Genesis chapter 1 verse 11 says this. He says, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit yielding fruit after itself, whose seed is in itself. Meaning that every time you see a fruit, the fruit is carries a tree. If you can plant the fruit, every fruit you see has the potential of a tree. You have the potential of a tree. If you don't understand that you have potentials, you will never work at it. That reminds me of the story, a business story of a, of, of a company that most of you are familiar with, McDonald's. You know, somewhere in the early 90s, what happened? Um, um, two brothers, the, the McDonald's brothers, they, they, they created a restaurant and it was doing so well, doing so very well. As a matter of fact, it was doing so well that a sales and marketing person called Ray Crocs came there and he was just so blown away by the operation. He, he partnered with them as, you know, he consulted to ex- help them expand their operation. Then, in 1961, you know what he did? He just told the McDonald brothers and said, hey, you guys have done so well with this. He put a check on the table and a check for $2.7 million. That's still a lot of money. And says, I would love to buy the company from you. And you know what? Once you don't know what you carry, you can settle for anything on time. That's why I tell people, don't negotiate on an hungry stomach. You know, guys... When you don't have a job, it's not time to look for a girlfriend. Get a job first. You might think better and choose better. The problem is that most people are negotiating for their future where they don't have something to negotiate for or to negotiate with, rather. So they sold the McDonald's for 2.7 million. Ray Cox began to work on it. This was 1961. Today, McDonald's net worth is about 200 billion. The company was sold for $2.7 million a few years ago. But it's now what? $200 billion, almost $200 billion, a few years after. Question, I think, did the McDonald brother know that it could become that big? Obviously, if they knew that the business had that potential, they will never sell it. But the person that bought the business, did he know that it could become that big? Obviously, yes. Because if he didn't know it would become that big, he would not even buy it. The reason I'm saying so is this. You can carry potentials and others can see it and you are the ones that cannot see your potentials. And when you cannot see your potentials, you will sell it for cheap. Look at Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot looked at Jesus Christ. I don't know what went through his mind. I don't know what he drank that morning. And he thought all Jesus worth was 20 pieces of silver. And he sold Jesus for 20 pieces of silver. He imagined the opportunity to be among the first 12 apostles. And he lost it. And the reason I'm saying so is this. Many people have a potential. Everyone has potential. That's where I started from. Moses had potential. When God called him, he said, who am I? God says, I see potential in you. 
You know what I'm saying so right now? You may think you're a housewife, but you have potential on the inside of you. You may think that nobody knows you, but you have potential on the inside of you. You say, this business is so small, but there's potential there. God, you slaves, slaves, who are slaves? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they were slaves. They have got some potential in slaves. As a matter of fact, a donkey spoke in the Bible. The donkey had potential. How can a donkey have potential and you think you don't have potential? There's no one that God has made without potential. But unfortunately, most people are not aware of their potential. And what really happens is this. Not only are most people not aware of their potential, most people never deploy their potential fully. One writer said, he said, a wasted life is a life that did not deploy its potentials. And I'm saying to you, how can I unlock my potentials? You know, I, 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 if, if, if you grew up, when I grew up, you'll have heard the story of Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson was a fast runner. But somehow in between his running, he, you know, he was found guilty at some other race of, you know, of taking um, um, drugs to help, help the running. And, and you know what? They suspended him for two years and he came back again and they disqualified him permanently. And Ben Johnson is still alive to today, but nobody knows about Ben Johnson. When you talk about runners, nobody, and, and this was a black, is a Jamaican Canadian. Nobody knows about Ben Johnson like we would know. But, but the reason why Ben Johnson had potentials, but guess what? For potentials to become result, there's something you have to do. And that's the difference. For potentials to become result, there's going to be discipline and what? Training. So Ben Johnson did not want to go through that route. He began to look for shortcuts and what? He began to take drugs to make him faster. The reason why most people, their potential does not manifest as theirs because they are looking for shortcuts. They don't want to give themselves to discipline. They don't want to give themselves to training. Listen to me. You are either going to play today and gain tomorrow or you are going to gain today and pay tomorrow. You can have your cake and you can eat your cake and have it. And this is a Bible principle. If you, everybody has potentials. But the people, but the people that become winners are those that learn how to discipline themselves, how to hone their potential, how to activate their potential. And that takes a lot of work. Glory to God. I said glory to God. <laughs> Let me read something to you quickly in Matthew chapter 4. Oh, because this is going to be powerful. So guess what? People's potentials are never deployed because they never knew it. Because people are not willing to give themselves to training. You know, sometimes people say like, you know, when I, you know, I was watching basketball one day and I saw all those NBA players just go, you know, and I, oh, that's easy. So I got to the court one day. That's very difficult. In fact, let me say this to you. Whatever is so easy to do, just know that there's a lot of work behind the scene that makes it that simple. But... One day, someone told Michael Jordan, "Say you're so lucky, you have the magic hands. And he says, if you practice 1,000 balls every day, you will get so lucky. Behind what seems like effortless success are hours and hours and hours of labor and hours of labor. And the reason I'm saying so, for example, recently someone was arrested that you all know, a social media phenomenon. And a, lot, a group of people were arrested. We don't know what is true or what is not true. But there's a generation that doesn't want to put in the hours but wants to see the harvest. If you don't put in the hours, you can see the harvest. God made everyone with potential. Matthew chapter 4. Let's read what Jesus Christ said here. Let me ask you a quick question. When did you invest into learning? When did you invest into prayer? Matthew chapter 4 verse 19. Someone says this, if you only do the things you feel like, you will get nowhere in life. Reason is this, it takes discipline to get ahead. Matthew 4 verse 19, see what Jesus Christ said here. The Bible says this, Jesus Christ in verse 18, Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, 
casting a net into the sea for they were fishers. And he said unto them, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I said, my God, this is incredible. Jesus Christ saw Peter and saw, and saw those two guys and he looked at them. And when he looked at them, they were ordinary fishermen. Fishermen catch fishes. But when Jesus looked at them, he was the creator. He saw their potential. He says, you are destined to catch more than fish. You are destined to do more than water. You are destined to catch men. Only God can say that. And for everyone that thinks there's nothing about your life, that means you've never heard the voice of God. Because when you hear the voice of God, it has the capacity to unlock the potential on the inside of you. Because in the first place, he put it inside there. So Jesus Christ said, he said, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Did you notice something? He said two things here. He said, you have potentials to become huge fishers of men. But because before you become fishers of men, you have to what? Follow. Why? To turn potential into result, he's going to take training and what? Discipline. You know I'm saying this to you? I'm going to zero in right now. Whatever you are doing, your business has potential. Listen to me. It's not as though your business has not potential. But the indiscipline in which you run your business with is killing it. It's not as though that you don't have financial potential. But you have not been able to sit down together and do something consistently. You are so indisciplined about your financial habits. So why am I saying this to you? Jesus Christ looked at them and said, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. So guess what? Every man has potentials. But how do I turn potential to productivity? Through discipline and training. Through discipline and training. Why am I saying this to you? I'm saying this to you because of Romans chapter 8. Let me, because I want to show you what God says about your potential today. Romans chapter 8. This is good. From NLT, verse 29. See what the Bible says. Romans 8, verse 29. It says, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son. Watch this. It says, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son. What is my potential? As a Christian, before you were born, your potential was that you become Christ like. I want to take note of that. Your potential is that you become Christ like. You know, the reason I'm saying so is this. God, every Christian, the potential of every Christian is discipleship. So say, how do you know that? Because Matthew 28 verse says this this way. He says, go and make disciples of all men. Watch this. God can never tell you to make disciples of people when they don't have the capacity to become disciples. The reason why God can tell you to make disciples of people is because he made them and he put to them an inherent ability to become disciples. But guess what? Many Christians have made the decision to follow Jesus, but they are not yet disciple. And the reason is simple because discipleship takes following. Discipleship takes training. Discipleship takes what? It takes discipline. And you hear nonsense like, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a disciple. Listen to me. There's nothing like that. A genuine Christian is a disciple. That's what it is. A genuine Christian is a disciple. What does the Bible say? The, the Bible says, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. He says, if anyone will come, the first thing that you have to come, you must pursue. The reason I'm saying so is this, just like the McDonald's story, there's potential in the business, but can you bring up potential from it? I'm saying so because when it comes to Christian work, one of the things I see is this, you don't realize this, that number one, this is the first thing you need to realize, that I'm designed to be like Christ. It's my design. It's not something I want to be like. It's my design. So when I'm going to be like Christ, it's not a mistake. That is actually my design. When you hear Christians say that, you know what? You know, I'm born again, but I'm not a prayer person. You got it wrong. You're lying. 
because you are designed to be like Christ. What does that mean? Whatever Christ is, you are. Whatever Christ can do, you can do. So the reason I know that you are a prayer person is this. Christ was prayerful. So you are prayerful. Someone says, I just have problems with loving people and forgiving people. That's not true. The reason why is that the reason why you say you have problems with loving people and, you know, and not praying is because you keep listening to your feelings. But you have to start listening to your inner person, your real potential. What does your real potential say? Your real potential says that the life you live is by the faith of the Son of God. That the old life that was difficult, that the old life that was dead was crucified and died. That there's a new life in you. The old life has nothing on you. You have potentials in the Spirit. So if I have potential in the Spirit, what's my, pot- what's my potential in the Spirit? A disciple. How can I bring out that potential? Through training and what? Discipline. Through training and discipline. Let's read some scripture together. And I hope that this will really, 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 really bless you today. First Corinthians chapter 9. Maybe we're going to start from Matthew 16 first. And we're going to first Corinthians chapter 9. Matthew 16 verse 24. See what the Bible says. And Jesus said unto the disciples, If any man will come after me, let him, he says, if any man will come after me. Listen to me. It's one thing to go to church. It's one thing to watch a service online. It's another thing to be someone that pursues Jesus. There are people that go to church and don't know Jesus. There are people that go to church and closer to hell than heaven. There are people that go to church and they flock and live with demons. Because church is not an excuse for knowing God. It's meant to help you know God. But you can go to church. You can play church. You can play a pastoral position and know no God. As a matter of fact, you can walk for God and not walk with God so Jesus Christ says hey before we get it all confused if any man will come after me he said the first place is this there must be that strong desire to come after me the, the reason I'm saying so is this you have the potential to be a full full blown disciple of Jesus so I said, I'm born again that full blown no 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 who is a disciple a disciple is a follower of Christ. Follower means what? Is a follower and imitator of Christ. It has the values of Christ. It has the thinking of Christ. It has the behavior of Christ. He has the structures of Christ. He has the outlook of Christ. He has the perspective of Christ. And listen, that is a huge journey for everyone. Because some people are born again, but um, it's not an area. Listen, any area God cannot touch shows the area you have not been discipled. They came to, you know, the disciples came to John because John had introduced Jesus Christ and Jesus' ministry was blowing up and John's ministry was shrinking and they said, John, what's going on? People are leaving you to him. And John, being a great disciple, says, no, he must increase and I must decrease. That is the prayer of every true disciple. What does every true disciple say? He says, none of me but all of him. All I have, I count but dung for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. What does every disciple say? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to know him more. That's what every disciple says. Every disciple says, a servant cannot be above his master. And so it's not about me at all. When you see Christians that because things are tough, forget God, they were never disciples. You know why? Real discipleship shows in tough times. I'm telling you, the beauty of discipleship shows when you can have a baby and you're believing God and you can understand why. And people say, why are you still standing with God? And you say, even though he slays me, I will not deny him. That's a disciple. Real disciple shows in tough time when nobody is coming to get married to you and you say, I will not bow down. You will speak like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What did they say? They say, we are not careful to answer the king in this matter. He says, our God is able to deliver us from the fairy furnace, but if he does not, we are ready to burn. We will not bow. We can burn. He says, we will not bow. We don't care to burn. Is that the kind of Christianity you are? Are you a thermometer Christian? Oh, what kind of Christian are you? What is a Timothy Christian? You change with conditions. When you are with people that are godless, you become godless. When you go to a party, you become godless. When you, you, you just change your condition. Or are you a Christian that has 
deep convictions. You know what it is. You know what it is. You believe God. Jesus said to his disciple, Matthew 24, if any man sees it, ah, I know you sit down in your home. Some of you, you're even cooking as you're doing this. This is not the kind of message you, you, you sit on the bed and this is the kind of message you have to sit up. It says, if any man will come after me, let him. It says, you must come after me. What does come? Come means there must be that pursue. You must get up and say, you know what? Nothing else matters that I want to go after God. And I'm not going after God because what I want to get. I'm going after God because of who He is to me and His love and His kindness. The contamination of Pentecostal Christianity is pushing propaganda, which people call gospel. And that gospel says that we come to God to get something. Listen to me. We didn't make Him. He made us. If He made us, we had what? We, we we are part of his plan. He is not part of our plan. We should be living unto him, not him living unto God. God is not someone that you use. So God is someone that you live for. Glory to God. Is if any man will come after him, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. That's huge. He said, you must come. Question. This is what I want to ask you. This is a question for you. Am I, can I really say I'm pursuing a very active relationship with Jesus? I, I never say, can I say I'm praying? You can be demonized and pray. You can read the Bible. You can read the Bible. Some, Simon the sorcerer wanted the Holy Ghost. He wanted to speak in tongues. He even spoke in tongues. He wanted to start laying hands on people. What I'm talking about today is spiritual velocity. What's spiritual velocity? Your passion for God. Your pursuit of God. It's the way the things of God energizes you. Some of you, when Asna or Manu scores a goal, you will be so joyous. Everybody knows something has happened. But when you hear the word of God, how come you are not that excited? How come you are not that full of joy? Because there is no emotional connection to the things of God. Like it is with Manu and Asna. I love those clubs. But listen, God is bigger than that. Some of you even get a check from a contractor you go crazy you said this is beautiful but listen to me how come God's word by itself does not excite you how come when they say let us pray you go down how come when they say let us fast you are so angry if any man will come after me first Corinthians chapter 9 Listen to me. Back to the story of McDonald's. The McDonald brothers, I don't know what they saw in that business. They sold it out for $2.7 million. I'm sure when the McDonald's brothers saw the business, they thought they had a breakthrough and they had a good deal. If they were alive today, they would know it's a bad deal. Many of you are making deals with life, circumstances of life and situation because you don't know the future that God has for you. If you understand the future that God has for you, you will not even settle. How can you settle? How can you compare $2.7 million to $200 billion? Look, if you want to get married, you just settle. You can settle. You have to get deeper than that. So let's read this together. First Corinthians 9. Oh, unlocking. So this inner... So someone says, what is the inner opportunity talking about? It's the fact that discipleship is into you. That's what it is. All God wants you. Listen, Romans 8, 29 says something. You were made to be like Christ. That be like Christ is called discipleship. That means I talk like Christ. Question, in traffic, when someone gets on your nerves, do you use the F word? Do you curse them out? When, when your mother-in-law gets on your nerves and says all those things, do you hold that in unforgiveness? These are the natural things to do as a natural human being. But these are not the things you do as a Christ follower. Who is a disciple? A disciple says, what would Jesus do? That is what I'm meant to do. When Shinana comes in the office and looks at you and gives you and gives you that losing look and shakes it on the right and shakes a baby. Ooh, will you come over tonight? And you're like, no, no, I'm not a Christian. And you're like, oh, come on, don't touch. And she touched your nose. Oh my God. Will you remember that 
what would Jesus Christ do? Jesus would say, flee all our parents of evil. When your income has been cut into two, and the bills are growing, and Jesus Christ say, honor me with 10% of your, of your money. But it's a tough decision because you've exhausted your savings, you have bills. Do you know what it means to still put God first? Because if you cannot, listen to me, in the Bible, there was only one time God compared himself with something else. He compared himself with mammon. He says, you are either worshipping money or worshipping God. The way you show you're worshipping God is this, to be able to take off your money and give him 10%, to be able to release your money as often as you can release it. And that is what true discipleship is. Anybody can give in surplus. Anybody can give when the economy is booming. This is when we know those that are really committed to Christ because when it gets tougher discipleship don't back out they get tougher also 1 Corinthians chapter 9 when last did you pray when last did you read the Bible is your spiritual fire dying are you like the church in the book of Revelation he says hey remember where you're falling your first love see what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 Verse 24, know ye not that all that run in the race, know ye not that all that run, run in the race, but one receives the crown. In other words, everybody has potential. He says in the last line, he says, run that you may obtain. He says, don't just have potential. He says, deploy your potential. You know, when criticism, we know, criticism, you know, I'm not a church person. Listen to me. When you're a follower of Jesus, you lose the right to tell God what you to lose the right to decide what is right because that decision is with God he said you know I'm not a prayer person listen to me you don't even know who you are it's God that reveals who you are to you because the life you have originally that life died Galatians says chapter 2 verse 20 he said the life I now live I live by the faith of the son of God that means this new life is not based on my feeling because if this new line is based on my feeling I will wreck myself if this new line is based on what I look at I will wreck myself he says this new life is a life of faith so I don't feel like worshipping but I get there and lift up my hands towards heaven and say father I worship you not because I feel like because I live by faith I don't feel like fasting but I deny myself of food I don't like Bible study but I give myself to the word because it's not my feeling you know I, I, I don't feel like giving but I sow my seed just because it's I live by faith I want to ask you a true disciple lives by faith not feeling so you need to ask yourself am I living by feelings or living by faith based on God's word Paul said this it says Verse 25, and every man that strives for mastery is temperate in all things. They do this to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. He says, I, I therefore run not as uncertain, so fight I, not one that beat the air. Verse 27 says, I keep my body. This is what I do. He says, I keep my body and put it under subjection, lest by any means when I preach to others, I will be a castaway. He says, from potential to become productivity, I'm going to suppress my feelings. I'm going to suppress my feelings. Hey, my feelings said, go crazy. I will suppress it. When you put your culture before God, you're in the wrong place. When you put your opinions before God's word, you're in the wrong place. When you put logical thinking before God's word, you're in the wrong place. When you, when you are so moved by this word, you are in the wrong place. Glory to God. I said glory to God. Oh, wow. You know what I'm saying? So, someone says, so th- th- this is the first thing about discipleship. Someone says, you know the thing, I've been born again for a while, but there are some things I find hard to do. You know, I just do what I'm able to do. Let me tell you something. One of the reasons why people are not able to deploy their spiritual potentials is because of self-limiting beliefs. What are self-limiting beliefs? These are thought patterns about yourself, about your identity. For some reason, you've told yourself, I'm not a prayer type. How do you know that? Is that what God told you? You don't know who you are until God tells you who you are. Someone says, you know, me, I'm not that spiritual type. You don't even know who you are until God tells you you are. You are so soaked in your opinion about yourself. Someone says, you know, you know I'm a mature person. This is not about age. This is about the Word of God. And many people have self-limiting belief. They say, you know, I'm born again, but I can't stop the addiction. 
I am born again, but I can't change my perspective on this. I am born again, but I can't change this and that. That's not the way it ought to be. Someone says, it's difficult for me. The reason why it's difficult for you is this. In the first place in your mind, you think that, you think that this is just difficult. Listen, when God says you do something, it could seem ridiculous. But I remind myself, God is working in me both to will and to do of His good pleasure. You know what that means? God tells me to do something. He goes behind me and begins to encourage me to do it. So how do, I become a, how do I become a strong disciple? By accepting and believing that I am a disciple. That's where you start from. But that's the first decision. By accepting and believing I am a disciple, that I was uniquely formed by Christ to be like him. That's what the Bible says in Colossians. That's what the Bible says in Romans, that we should conform to the image of his dear son. The second thing is this. Hallelujah. Why should I be a follower of Jesus Christ? Because... My profitability and usefulness is multiplied because I'm a disciple. See, listen, Peter will have been a fisherman forever. Some of you, you want, to, you want your life to be significant? Can, can I have my tea, please? So watch this now. Watch this thing. I, I said the more, I said... When I follow Jesus, my profitability and usefulness is multiplied. My life becomes more profitable to myself and to those around me. The more God uses you, you become useful. The less God uses you, you become useless. Look at this tea bag. This tea bag, this is a tea bag. You put it inside hot water. Let's see what happens. This is another tea bag here. You, tip, you put this tea bag inside cold water. Let's see what happens after some time. Let's see what happens. Let's leave it. So what happens, what happens eventually is this. What happens, this is what I want you to really know and learn. That the more I yield to God, because a disciple, watch this now. Normal people are containers. They contain it. But a disciple is a channel. When you contain something, all you can carry is all that there is. When you're a channel, God can flow through you. Once you're a disciple, God can flow through you to bless other people. He can use you to start a business that is multi-billions because it wants you to be a blessing. He can use you to reach people in Rwanda. You know, God doesn't mind to give you money. He knows you will spend it right. God knows you will do the right thing. But why are people afraid of discipleship? The reason is this, because it costs something. What does it cost? Watch this now. I don't know if you can see this. I hope you can. Can you see it? Look at my tea. This is the cold water. This is the water that is, everybody likes it. It's convenient. The tea didn't change. The tea wasn't brewed well. Look at the hot water. The water color has changed already. You know why I'm saying this, saying this to you? This is, that's all I want to say now about that. The reason I'm saying this to you is discipleship sometimes is like God take you through hot water. But the reason why it's tough and you go through hot water is simple. The reason is simple. What's the reason? Because... When you go through water, God is able to bring the content inside you out. And that's why the discipline is there. That's why the compliance is there. That's why the training is there. Because there are potentials you carry that God wants to bring out of you. There are potentials you carry that God wants to bring out of you. But most of you don't like the hot water. What you want is the cold water. The cold water has been here for a long time right now. The water has not changed. Because, listen to me, the temperature that will train you might be inconvenient for you. The reason why God has not been able to walk through you is because He wants to walk in you first. God wants to walk in you first. They are Christians because of the current economic crisis. Their faith is breaking down. I know that things are tough, but Paul said something. Even in hunger, in pestilence, in famine, he says, we will not give up. We will not break down. That is the word of a disciple. Because the disciple understands tough time doesn't crack me. It brings things out of me. And guess what? The Bible makes us understand this. The more you are yielded to God as a life, as a business person, as a career person, God can flow through you. 
What was the secret of David? David said one thing. It was just about one thing. What was it? That his heart was after God. Let's look at Psalm 63 as I pray. Psalm 63 as we pray today. Glory to God. Psalm 63. Oh, glory to God. I don't know where you're walking, God. I don't know where you are in the things of God, but God is calling you back to who you used to be. God is letting you know that I chose you as a disciple. I've called you to a place of prayer. Don't say I'm not a man of prayer. You are a man of prayer. Don't say I'm not a man of faith. You are a man of faith. Don't say I'm not a man of love. You are a man of love. Don't say I'm not a man of mercy. You are a man of mercy. You are a woman of mercy. You are a man. You are a woman of love. Don't say I'm not given to giving. You are given to giving. Because you are like Jesus. Look at what David said. Psalm, and let me tell you something. Once your heart is after God, your usefulness will increase. Because I used to ask myself, God, why do you choose some people? And one reason. He says, the reason all he saw about David was simple. I found a man after my heart. Psalm 63, verse 1. See what David said. He said, oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. He says, my soul, my soul is thirsting. He said, my soul is thirsty for you. He said, some people are looking for contracts. That's good. Some people say, if I don't find a husband, I will die. That's good. Some people say, it's a baby God. David said, I don't want money. I don't want position. All I want is you, oh God. Oh my God. Why won't this person stand out from the multitude? What is he? What is hindering you from growing spiritually is that you are so self-centered and so consumed in what you want and you forget you didn't make yourself. That before you were made, God had a plan for your life. Don't say, you know, uh, I enjoy this church at home because, you know, I've gotten used to it. It's good to be to church at home. But when church resumes, we're also there as far as it's okay and safe. See what the Bible says, David said. He says, my flesh is longing for thee in a dry and a thirsty place where there is no water. He says, to see thy power and thy glory as I've seen in the sanctuary. David said, what I want is deep. What I want more than church. But David said, I want a deep relationship. I want to know God and he knows me. I want to get into an intense place of the spirit. David said, this is what I'm looking for. This is what God is calling you on to. People can play church. People can play religion. But how many people know God? The Bible says they that know their God shall be strong and they shall do exploits. So I, says, I want to know God also. Listen to me. Proof. Sorry, pursuit is the proof of desire. If you want to know God, it's not what you say. It's what you pursue. You pursue it. You pursue it. You pursue it. Proverbs 18 says, A man will separate himself because of a desire that he has. You pursue it. How do you pursue it? By keeping your hunger for the Lord. Where's your hunger? Someone said, Okay, how can I get hungry for the things of God? Listen to me. What did you ask yourself is this. What is killing your hunger for God? Because some of you were never like this before. You had a pa- you had fire burning your spirit. How? Because everybody is born with hunger. If you were not born with hunger, you were dead. Because hunger is a sign of health. People lose appetite when they get sick for you not to have the appetite to pursue God Bible knowledge fellowship worship that makes you spiritually sick and you need to get back to it you need to get back to it God is restoring your hunger today you need to ask yourself because everybody has hunger what happens is this people don't pay attention to their spiritual hunger as a matter of fact this is what I say if you have a great wife like my wife that can cook great at home, if you keep eating gala and all those things on the road, when you get home, there will be no appetite. Not because there is no hunger, but you keep filling it with the wrong thing. Many of you have filled the hunger with Instagram, with social media, with work, with children, with marriage, but the hole is still there. It's time to not distract yourself with those things. It's time to begin to pay attention to God and say, God, I'm hungry. And say, God, I'm thirsty. How do you feel your hunger? The way you feel your hunger is what? 
Oh Lord, exposure. Exposure. What is exposure? When I was a younger Christian, I would stay hours and watch Kenny Hagin. We would borrow the tapes and watch Benny Hain and watch Brother Copeland. And all those things will fall up in my spirit. The reason why is it whatever you focus on, you attract. Question, do you focus on materials that makes you hunger for God? Or you focus on materials that distract you from God? Or you focus on material that has no impact on your spiritual life? We pray every morning, 6.30 a.m. You should be there on Instagram. You should be there because you're hungry. You want to burn with those that burn for God. You've been in church for some time. Do you belong to a small group, a company of people that are on fire for Jesus? The question is, Lord, let me burn for you. Lord, let me burn for you. Let me burn for you, O oh God. Grant me hunger. As we take the communion today, that's something I want to pray for. That there will be fresh baptism of fire, prayer fire, hunger for God. The lost love will be restored by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, let's pray. And Lord, baptize afresh with hunger for you. Let every distraction collapse. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.